When you picture a sloth, you probably think of the friendly, slow-moving, defenseless, tree-dwelling animal. However, did you know that once giant sloths the size of elephants roamed the Americas? Hard to imagine, right? But these giant sloths are actually the ancestors of the sloths we see today. Sloths are Xenatherans, a group of animals from South America consisting of armadillos, anteaters, sloths, and their extinct relatives. But what exactly are Xenatherans, and how did they come to dominate South America? Xenatherans were previously thought to be related to pangolins and aardvarks due to their similarities. However, more recent genetic evidence reveals that their true relatives are Afrotherians, such as elephants and golden moles. The ancestors of Xenatherans did not reach South America by land when it was connected to Africa. Instead, they likely rafted across the then narrow Atlantic Ocean on logs or rafts of vegetation. Their low metabolic rate would have helped them survive this journey. Although this would not be the last time this would happen, as this is how monkeys and rodents also reached South America, and rapidly diversified into all kinds of species. The first sloths originated during a period of long isolation. Back then, South America wasn't connected to any other continent. What a strange land it must have been, with its mammalian fauna largely consisting of marsupials, xenatherans, and monkeys. Sloths today are represented by two groups, two- and three-toed sloths, which are not closely related, but evolve similar arboreal adaptations independently. Sloth and other Xenatherans spread into North America when the Isthmus of Panama formed around 3 million years ago, allowing species to migrate between the continents. However, this trade-off was not equal, with many more North American species invading South America, decimating much of South America's unique animals. Most ancient sloths were terrestrial ground sloths, who before humans reached the Americas, had a huge distribution from Patagonia in the south to Alaska in the north. So just how big did they get? Ground sloths? were giants. Some weighed over 4,000 kilograms. Meanwhile, those on Caribbean islands were the size of cats. The reason they evolved this huge size is simple. Before the Great American Interchange, South America had very few grazing mammals. So sloths came to fill the ecological niche usually occupied by animals like rhinos and cattle. Being grazers, they would have fed out in the open, making them vulnerable to predators. And in response, grew so big that few predators could take them down. Their large size and formidable claws offered significant defense against predators. But what other strategies did these colossal sloths use to survive? For one, their snouts indicate that they had a very good sense of smell, although they probably lacked good eyesight and hearing. But examination of their fossils tells us that they are attuned to hearing low frequencies, possibly as a way to communicate. Ground sloths could adopt a bipedal stance when stationary, allowing the arms to be used to grasp vegetation and use their claws for defense. If they were solitary or social is heavily debated, but it is possible that some were solitary and others lived in complex social structures. Another highly debated topic of ground sloth is if they had slow metabolisms like modern Xenatherans, who in fact have the lowest metabolisms of all mammals, excluding the monotremes like echidnas and platypuses. Ground sloths only gave birth to a single offspring at a time, and engaged in long-term parental care with several years between births, with the megalonyx found with two juveniles of different ages, with the oldest being three or four years old, and the other just being a year old. Young ground sloths may have clung to their mother's body after birth like modern sloths, which they do to protect themselves from predators. But that wasn't the only way they protected their young. In South America, huge tunnels have been found. These tunnels are remarkably large, with some measuring up to two meters in diameter and extending for hundreds of meters, with claw marks on the sides, similar to those that could have been made by sloths, indicating the presence of massive sloths that were capable of significant excavation. But why did these giants create such remarkable feats of engineering? Well, the purpose of these burrows is unknown, but was likely a combination of protection from predators, which would have been useful as ground sloths were too slow to outrun them, a way to keep safe from extreme heat or cold, and a safe place to raise offspring. Besides ground sloths, some paleo burrows may have been used by other large Pleistocene animals, such as giant armadillos. But as I said before, claw marks show that giant sloths are the main creators of these burrows. Many ground sloths may have been hairless, as due to their low surface area to volume ratio, they would have overheated fast with a thick coat of fur, which would have been a strange sight, as sloths resemble aliens without fur. Let's take a brief look at the different families of ground sloths. I say brief, but there is a lot to cover. The most famous family of ground sloths, Megalonychidae, first appeared in the late Eocene, around 35 million years ago in Patagonia, although one possible find on Seymour Island off the shore of Antarctica may suggest that they first appeared around 40 million years ago, when South America and Antarctica were still connected by land. The first megalonychids were small and partly tree-dwelling, but by the Pliocene, about 5 to 2 million years ago, some species of this family were already approximately 1.5 meters tall. 
whereas in contrast, some of the species in the West Indies were about the size of a cat, becoming small both to deal with the heat of the tropics and island conditions. As discussed in the last video, island conditions often cause large animals to become small and small animals to become big in processes known as island dwarfism and gigantism. Megalonyx, meaning giant claw, was a widespread genus from North America. Megalonyx jeffersonii, commonly referred to as the Jefferson's ground sloth, could exceed 1,000 kilograms and was found in Alaska, much of the USA, parts of southern Canada, and down into Mexico. The discovery of Megalonyx and the subsequent naming by Thomas Jefferson marked the beginning of paleontology in North America. Although he mistakenly believed the bones to be from a large carnivorous cat, but later advises after hearing of the discovery of ground sloth fossils in Patagonia, which matched the bones he had been sent. Thomas Jefferson instructed Meriwether Lewis to keep an eye out for ground sloths when Lewis and Clark set out on their expedition across what would become the USA, although it had gone extinct 12,000 years prior to this. Jefferson thought they may encounter some in the Rocky Mountains. Looking at a phylogeny tree, we can see that these megalonychids are the closest ancestors of modern-day three-toed sloths, showing an interesting evolutionary lineage from these large ground-dwelling creatures to the smaller arboreal sloths we see today. And in stark contrast to the small arboreal sloths, the family with the largest ground sloths, Megatheria Day, first appeared around 30 million years ago, and yeah, you guessed it, South America. This group includes the colossal Megatherium and Aremotherium, which is the largest known ground sloth, with estimated body masses up to 5 tons, which is more than the average Asian elephant, and actually taller than African elephant bulls. The skeletal structure of these ground sloths indicates their massive size. To deal with this weight, they had evolved very thick bones and joints, so that they wouldn't break under the pressure of this huge animal. Their large size and formidable claws offered significant defense against predators. Some scientists have even hypothesized that Megatherium not only scavenged, but also used its huge size to steal kills from predators. But isotope analysis has shown us that they were herbivores, so the idea that they were omnivorous is more speculation than anything. One genus from this family, Aremotherium, which roam more tropical areas like Florida, Central America, and the northern part of South America, may have lived in groups, with 22 individuals being found together in Ecuador. This group of sloths are believed to have congregated at a waterhole until an unexplained event sealed their fate. The Nothrotheriidae were not as large as the two previously mentioned families, but one member of this family, Thalassochnus, from the west coast of South America, had a very interesting adaptation. It evolved to a semi-aquatic and eventually fully aquatic marine lifestyle. To counteract buoyancy, Thalassochnus developed heavy bones and a long tail for diving and balancing. It likely walked along the seafloor, using its claws to dig up food, making it the only aquatic xenarthran to have ever existed. Thalassochnus reached a substantial size of 3.3 meters and showed evidence of having a trunk-like structure similar to tapirs. And as mentioned before, this species inhabited the coast of Chile and Peru, but didn't persist after the formation of the Isthmus of Panama, which disrupted water flow from the Caribbean and cooled the warm waters needed for seagrasses to grow. But other Nothrotheriids survived much longer, with some having died so recently that their subfossil dung has remained undisturbed in some caves in the modern-day United States. One notable skeleton, was found in a lava tube in New Mexico and still had preserved skin and hair, showing just how recently these animals roamed our planet. Another family is the Mylodontids, which maxed out at four meters in length and 4,000 kilograms in weight. One member of this family, Mylodon, ranged further south than any other sloth, stretching right down to the edge of Chile. The first fossils of Mylodon were actually found in Argentina by Charles Darwin, who collected their remains on his voyage to South America. Yes, the same one on which he proposed his theory of natural selection. Some have hypothesized that Mylodon was omnivorous and occasionally scavenged for meat left by carnivores. Subfossil remains including fossilized dung, fur, and skin have been discovered in notable quantities because their range included glacial areas where preservation is more likely. Mylodontids were actually the closest relatives of two-toed sloths, whereas the megalochnids were the most genetically distinct family of sloths, splitting from all others around 33 million years ago. These were the last ground sloths to die out. But why did the ground sloths go extinct? It might have something to do with us. The Shasta ground sloth from Arizona left behind a massive deposit of subfossilized dung and radiocarbon dating of the dung shows that they were flourishing until suddenly disappearing around 11,000 years ago. But what could have caused such a sudden disappearance? Could it have been us? Scientists think so. It might not surprise you that this is exactly when humans first settled America's Southwest. Not too far away from this deposit, preserved trackways from around the same time show humans chasing three ground sloths. The tracks depict instances of a sloth rearing up on its hind legs 
to confront the people chasing them, with the tracks showing that people were approaching from multiple directions to disorientate the sloths. But the most solid evidence that their extinction was caused by us is that the island-dwelling sloths of the Caribbean survived 6,000 years longer than the mainland ground sloths, with their extinction precisely when people colonised them, with the last dying out around 2700 BC in Cuba. The few remaining sloths are small, arboreal, and thus difficult to spot, and less attractive prey to humans. And if climate change caused a sloth extinction, it would have most likely impacted the tree-dwelling species as well. A ground sloth kill site in Argentina shows that a megatherium was butchered at the edge of a swamp around 12,600 years ago, with clear marks on the animal's bones, and removing pieces of meat off a large animal would be quite easy. So many fossils of sloths that humans have killed would not have cut marks. People first entered the Americas through Beringia, a land bridge connecting North America and Asia, sometime during the last glacial maximum, probably around 17,000 years ago. These people are likely used to hunting the megafauna of the mammoth steppe, creating many weapons to assist them, and there is no doubt that they would have been able to hunt these animals, especially as ground sloths had certain characteristics and behavioural traits that made them more vulnerable to humans. Their feeding habits, slow speed, and unfamiliarity with humans made them easy targets. And although humans were almost certainly responsible for their extinction, climate change certainly helped, as when the world warmed coming out of the last ice age, many of the grasslands and savanna habitats that the ground sloths inhabited were replaced by closed canopy forests, vastly restricting their suitable habitat. But ground sloths weren't the only giants to rule over their habitat. Not too long ago, gorilla-sized lemurs ruled over Madagascar, and lizards the side of buses ruled over Australia. So go watch one of these videos if that interests you. And why not consider subscribing since you've made it to the end. I'll see you in the next one.